I think it's helpful just to start with what an investor's goals are and what their tolerances or other considerations are. Are you trying to achieve higher returns than the market? Are you comfortable underperforming the market by 8% in one year if it means having higher expected returns than the market? I think these are the kind of considerations investors need to have. Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Hotsko. And on today's episode, I'm joined by Wes Krill. Wes, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining me today. I've been such a big fan of Dimensional for a while. Your team puts out such great research on about just any investment topic you can think about. And it's really helped me form and develop my investment strategy and just made me a better investor. So I wanted to dive into some of the research that Dimensional puts out and some of your investment products today. But before we dive into all of that, can you share a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today at Dimensional? Yeah, sure. Uh, where to start? I mean, I think, I guess I go back to even before I started in the industry of finance. So I was a PhD student in material science and engineering back in North Carolina State. And as I started to think about what direction I wanted my career to go, I quickly started to come across considerations around how much impact my work would have. You know, as a scientist, you get a narrower and narrower focus where you learn lots of stuff. and Maybe what you're doing is only relevant for a small number of people. And I saw an opportunity to go into finance and to impact literally thousands of people through what I was doing. And so that became really appealing to me. Dimensional was a very natural fit from the start. I think that um, my natural, you know, my wife always talks about it as being glass half empty. I think it was just a very skeptical view on the world, but that was something that immediately connected me to Dimensional where, you know, just based on the uh, being grounded in academic theory and, you know, being skeptical in some ways of the world of research, I think there was just a natural philosophical fit right away. It was an attempt to, you know, not necessarily outsmart the market, but then to work with markets. And that just really resonated with me from the start. I started off in the research team at Dimensional, so doing a lot of empirical research studies around, you know, furthering our understanding of these what I'll call anomalies or factors that were uh, arising in the academic literature and then just figuring out, you know, what parts of that were relevant to our clients. And over the years, uh, I became really interested in the aspect of my work that was revolving around the communication to clients. And, you know, my team that I sit in, the Investment Solutions Group, really sits at the intersection between our investments and our clients. And it really helps me kind of further uh, the impact that I can have on clients through, you know, whether it's writing about things that are of topical interest to our clients, um, and then also articulating Dimensional's investment philosophy and how we sit within the broader investment landscape. So I think that more or less covers the last 12 years. <laughs> yeah, and it's so interesting, um, touching on Dimensional a little bit, for our listeners who just aren't familiar with Dimensional's strategy, can you talk a little bit about what makes Dimensional's investment strategy and philosophy just different from other active management companies? Yeah, in some ways, I've even heard the, the term that Dimensional is the grandfather of factor investing. Uh, Dimensional and I are about the same age, and so I sort of take offense to that one. I don't think of myself as a grandfather just yet. But, you know, we were founded back in 1981. We now are a global firm. We have about 1,500-ish employees across 14 different countries and different offices, uh, managing about $500 billion globally as of the end of September. But the key aspect is we have one investment philosophy, and that philosophy really is a deep-seated belief in the power of markets. Um, you know, there was evidence even dating back to the 60s showing that traditional active managers were trying to add value through outguessing markets, through timing markets, were not consistently successful. And so what we set out to do was to find ways to outperform markets without outguessing them. And that was simply just leveraging all of the research that was being done around differences in expected returns within stocks and bonds. And we quickly saw that there was a way to leverage all of that research. But the key ingredient here was the role of implementation. And you know, that's something that we were just fanatical about from the start is how can we implement this in the most efficient way possible? And and that's I think what we've been able to build over four decades now is just this expertise in implementing this way of investing. And, you know, it becomes almost an easier way to communicate what we're setting out to do, right? So if I tell you that I am going to outguess markets, that I have a secret widget that helps me pick stocks that the rest of the market doesn't have, that becomes harder to explain when investment results are uh, disappointing. 
But when we are setting about to capture differences in expected returns within markets, that becomes much easier to explain when investment results are disappointing. And so um, I find it to be a very refreshing way in some cases to invest this way. Um, and you know, fortunately, Dimensional has had a lot of success doing this. Yeah, I have to say the strategy, as soon as I learned about it, um, it was probably three or four years ago now. It made so much sense to me because as an investor who picks stocks, you will never know if it was due to luck or skill. You'll never be able to know. And with this strategy, you kind of take that out of it. And there's so much evidence behind why these expected returns, you can expect them going forward. And there's kind of an explanation for it, unlike stock picking. And so I want to dive into factors a little bit with you now. I recently had Larry Swedro on and we, he was talking about factor investing with us, how we can improve our expected returns by including these independent sources of risk. And then we were getting into, I guess, how to compare different funds. And so Dimensional is a leader in this space and they're actually available to retail investors now. So I wanted to dive a bit into these products with you and kind of compare them because there's a ton of ETFs available for retail investors and they can all target different factor exposures, small cap, small cap value. And so I think some investors just don't know where to start. I had a listener reach out and say they don't know where to begin to allocate their portfolio, like which factor to prioritize. So I guess, do you have any advice on how investors can think about which factors to prioritize? Yeah, it is challenging figuring out how to get started. And that's because there's a reason why we call this the factor zoo, for example. So there was an academic paper from a few years ago where they were looking across all of the academic literature on different factors and found 316 different ones that have been published. Uh, and so that just kind of suggests how daunting this task is. So then the question is, and this is part of the research that we do around this stuff, is how do you figure out which ones are useful, which ones are completely spurious, probably have no... Uh, economic intuition behind them, which ones are just repackaging of something else that's already been discovered. You know, that's kind of something for dimensional other practitioners to go through. I think it's helpful just to start with what an investor's goals are and what their tolerances or other considerations are. So it's like, okay, are you trying to achieve higher returns than the market? By definition, that means you're gonna have to deviate from the market. If you just hold everything in the entire market at its natural market cap weight, you're gonna get the market return. So if you want to do better, that means overweighting and underweighting certain groups of stocks. And from there, it's figuring out how much you're willing to differ from the market on a year-to-year -year basis. That's going to dictate how much you deviate from the overall market when you're over and underweighting certain stocks. So are you comfortable underperforming the market by you know 8% in one year if it means having higher expected returns than the market? I think these are the kind of considerations investors need to have. And then finally, when you're thinking about how you would want to deviate, and this comes back to your question about what factors would I want to choose, um, you want to have a really good sound underpinning for the factors or for these characteristics you're using to inform how you deviate from the market. There's kind of a point of limiting benefit where as you add more and more factors to a portfolio, you start to decrease the impact they have on your expected return. It's kind of a point of diminishing returns, I guess. I should say it happens pretty quickly once you get past two or three factors and the other stuff you're adding in is really just going to be adding in complexity And when you're thinking about your asset allocation. And so you want to be pretty judicious with these. You know, we always want to start with what is the theoretical basis for why I should see this factor in the first place. If you go shopping for anything, let's leave securities on the table for a second. If you go shopping for shoes, cars, watches, houses, you're thinking about two primary considerations that factor into your expected return, right? There's what do I expect to receive? So let's use a car, for example. What's the make, model, the trim level, the mileage on this thing? What's the brand's reputation for reliability? That's telling you something about what you expect to receive in the future. And then how do I make those characteristics meaningful for my purchase decision? Well, it's how much do I have to pay? So that's how we think about figuring out what factors are useful for deviating from the market is, okay, you know, what informs me about how much I'm paying? Well, we have a couple of price-based variables. There's market capitalization, or what some people call the size factor. You have value, so that's price scaled by fundamentals such as book equity. Those are giving you information about how much you're paying, right? And then we also think about profitability. Profitability is giving you some information about what you expect to receive in the future in terms of cash flows, whether it's dividends or share repurchases. 
And that comes about because profitability is a pretty sticky characteristic. So all it's being equal, the more profitable the firm is today, more profitable they'll be in the future. So that's a pretty parsimonious group of factors there. And, you know, we see that those have been really useful for deviating from the market because they are pretty low turnover. The other thing I'll mention about these is that they're applicable across the market. So using size, value, and profitability factors doesn't just mean holding stocks that rank really high on each one of those variables. You can actually do it in a seamless way across the market where you can have every stock in the U.S., for example, in your portfolio, but you can overweight stocks that have smaller market capitalization, uh, lower price-to-book ratio, you know, or deeper value, as we call them, or higher profitability. And I guess I'm just wondering then, so we can combine different factors and then there's also single factor products. So I guess when listeners are looking at different ETFs that offer single factor exposure versus a multi-factor exposure approach, how can we think about which one is better or maybe which one is right for us? Is it just that a multi-factor one perhaps has more risk than if it's say a small cap value versus a small cap ETF? How should we decipher maybe which one's best for our portfolio or do we buy both? How do they think about that? So this is where there's almost a, a bit of a, a surprising aspect of what are often called single factor investment solutions is there's really no such thing as sorting on only one variable. There's really no such thing as a single factor because when you sort stocks on a characteristic, let's use market capitalization as an example. If all I'm doing is sorting on market capitalization, I actually do get some inadvertent tilts towards other factors. Like for example, I'm probably gonna end up with lower profitability than the market if I only hold small caps. There is an interesting empirical result we see where if we go through and just look at the Morningstar category for strategic beta, that's kind of the name they have for investment strategies that use factors, so to speak, to deviate from the market. It only includes index funds, so it doesn't include everything out there that we would probably think of as a factor strategy. But it's a good proxy for what the universe looks like for all of these different strategies that tilt towards one or more factors. And the reason why I bring up this collection of strategies is if you put them all together in one bucket and calculate a weighted average return across all of these, I think these days is up to one and a half billion dollars worth of strategies, their return looks just like the market. In aggregate, they don't have meaningful deviations from the market. And that suggests there's a potential uh, outcome where if you have a collection of single factor strategies that are strung together, their tilts might end up offsetting each other and you can end up not getting what you're paying for. So for that reason, we think it's important to, in any strategy, have an integration of the information along with all of these different factors. Even if you're not referring it as a multi-factor strategy, you're balancing the trade-offs where if I sort towards small cap stocks, well, do I want to screen for lower profitability stocks? Now, the advantage with an integrated approach where it's a multi-factor type of strategy is for the same level of expected outperformance, let's say my goal is to outperform the market by, I don't know, I was throwing out a number 1% per year. The more factors I have in the portfolio, if I'm using size, value, and profitability together rather than just one of them at a time, the lower my overall deviation is from the market. The way we would measure that is tracking error. And you actually reduce that tracking error for your uh, given level of outperformance. So I would actually think of a multi-factor approach as in some ways lower risk than a single factor approach if my primary measurement of risk is how different from the market I am. I don't want to get too technical here, but I'm wondering, because I just read this in a paper the other day, how different factors are negatively or positively correlated with each other. And so value and momentum, I believe those were negatively correlated. So that increases diversification versus if they're positively correlated, maybe does that mean there's, I guess, more risk being taken on? So the way I think about it, and it's a really important consideration, by the way, if you're building a multi-factor portfolio, is you have to know how they interact. The way we would typically measure an interaction between these is the cross-sectional correlation. I'll explain what I mean by that in a second, but the cross-sectional correlation between the characteristics. So I already mentioned one where market capitalization and profitability are negatively correlated or positively correlated in the cross-section. So if I go towards small caps, I tend to give up some profitability, all else being equal. You mentioned another good one, which is you know, how does a stock become a value stock in the first place? Um, I'll, I'll give a spoiler for the audience. They tend to not IPO that way. 
Uh, they tend to become value stocks because they've had relatively poor performance compared to the market. But the momentum phenomenon, like you mentioned, we see that stocks that have had relatively poor returns over the past you know, six to 12 months tend to continue to underperform the market in the short term. So you want to be careful when you're buying stocks for a value portfolio that you're not catching a falling knife. And so, you know, we want to have provisions in place for our portfolio management process so that we are taking into account as this stock and downward momentum that can influence when we buy a stock for a value portfolio. And that's another way of potentially increasing expected returns just by virtue of the fact that you're taking in additional information about the expected returns of a stock. And that's why, you know, there's a whole host of things that we have to do within our strategies that really kind of come down to using different types of information. The momentum and value one is a particular interest because they both have very robust information about expected returns. And when I say robust, I mean that the empirical evidence, if you go back and look at premiums associated with value and profitability, very strong historical evidence supporting the existence of those premiums. So we want to use both those pieces of information but we're not going to use them in the same way. And the reason why is getting back to something I mentioned earlier, that value, and this is also true of market capitalization and profitability, they can inform the asset allocation of a portfolio in a way that it has very low expected turnover. So for example, a stock might stay in a value portfolio on average for about four to five years, which implies the turnover, so the amount of buying and selling you have to do for that portfolio might be only 20 to 25% per year. Momentum, on the other hand, if you look at academic definition of momentum, it's almost an entirely different set of stocks in a upward momentum portfolio from month to month. And the academic definition of the momentum factor has turnover well in excess of 100%. Turnover is never free. So to the extent that you can capture a premium associated with something like that without incurring the turnover, uh, that's always going to be beneficial for a portfolio. So it's finding ways to use stuff like momentum. And again, this is kind of what comes down to the expertise you built up over decades. This is really challenging to manage these things uh, if you're trying to launch investment strategies from scratch. Yeah, and I think some listeners might be thinking, how am I supposed to figure out which is best implementing? And it goes back to, I'm so glad you brought up the falling knife because I think that's why it's really important to look to the provider of the a factor ETF and figure out their underlying strategy. Because if they have a small cap strategy with say like a quality filter or something or relative profitability, see what their underlying index looks like or if it's just a passively managed one like Vanguard's products, it's not going to give you that same level of, I guess, like it's not going to have those filters that we need to perhaps get those premiums. And so that's kind of why I wanted to talk to you more today and really dive deep into these strategies because for factors, it does matter. It's not just which is the lowest cost one like we typically look for for passive ETFs. There's so much more that should go into our analysis of which fund is best. Yeah, cost is a tricky one because I think what matters to investors at the end of the day is total cost of ownership. That is not well approximated by an expense ratio. So I'll give you an example. So if we look at the way that these premiums, let's say I want to outperform the market by holding small cap value stocks, those premiums are not delivered really pro rata every single day. They tend to come in spurts. Um, you know, we saw that this year where you had really strong performance for the value premium over a very short period of time. So what that implies is you need to be continuously focused on those stocks with higher expected returns to really capture them most effectively. So what do we see from, let's just use a hypothetical example of an index fund that is, let's say, rebalancing only periodically. You know, most indices go through a either annual, semi-annual, or just periodic rebalancing. We call it a reconstitution where the index is redefined. So what is in the index yesterday might change today based on if a new stock becomes eligible, then that'll be added to the index. If a stock no longer fits the definition that the index is going after, then they will delete it. What happens from there? Well, index funds will follow suit. All the index fund managers will go out and buy the stocks that are going into the index. Again, they kind of have to, because if they're trying to preserve what well, tracking area, you need to mimic what the index is holding. Same deal with the deletions from the index. They have to sell those and in a very short order, again, to minimize tracking error versus the index. So then what happens in between these rebalance events? Well, 
This might come as a surprise, but prices don't wait to change for the next reconstitution events. Prices are continuously changing throughout the year in response to new information, changes in expectation. And so it becomes a bit of a drift phenomenon if you're approaching your turnover this way. Uh, one way I often to describe it is, you know, most people in the audience out there will elect to brush their teeth a couple minutes every day, right? That might be how they prepare for a dental exam. The alternative, if you want to handle your oral hygiene the way an index fund is going to approach its turnover, is just to brush your teeth once per year, a couple hours right before you go to the dentist. Clearly, one of those is going to have better outcomes for your oral hygiene than the other. And that's kind of the way we think about doing our turnover to capture these premiums. We believe that there is value in continuously repositioning your portfolio incrementally, just a little bit every day, so you can do the same amount of total turnover but spread out through the entire year. And that can really help investors. That's one of the ways that we try and add value versus the index type of approach. So, you know, an index fund tends to have very low expense ratios. But then if you look at what they might be giving up in terms of the premiums that are available for a more uh, flexible approach, you can see that's potentially an additional cost for investors. And so I did have a listener reach out and ask how they can build a globally diversified portfolio with as few as ETFs as possible with the highest expected return. So I guess their question was, how many of these factor ETFs do they have to hold and which ones? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, you can potentially do it with one portfolio. Yeah, you know, For example, I mean, there's there are multi-factor ETFs that would span all the different regions, whether it's U.S., developed ex-U.S., and emerging market stocks. It gives you an opportunity set of you know, more than 12,000 different stocks across 40-some countries and you know, lots of different currencies. Very well, very broadly diversified across the investment opportunity set. Now, when you bring in the expected return goal, I mean, there's always going to be a trade-off between diversification and expected returns. So if you if you want to outperform the market by a very large amount on expectations, then that means you're going to have to deviate from the market more. You won't have as broad of coverage or you won't, you'll have more deviation, I guess, from the overall market. Um, so it really just comes down to what your goals are. But there certainly are investment solutions out there that will offer this type of factor exposure across all of these different regions. And there are efficiencies, by the way, to doing it with fewer funds. You know, when we think about um, what we call our core portfolio. So it's, you know, strategies that uh, will cover an investable market, tilt towards these drivers of higher expected returns. Um, you can think of those as an amalgamation of component portfolios. So, you know, if I think about a market as being made up of large growth, large value, small growth, small value, you could have four different portfolios, each accounting for one of those quadrants and combine them together to replicate an overall region-wide portfolio or you can do it all in one portfolio, and there are some efficiencies when it comes to, you know, you don't have to sell something out of large value and then buy it in large growth if you have one portfolio, which just kind of seamlessly moves from one uh, part of the portfolio to another. So there certainly are opportunities to do that, and it kind of comes down to what your goals are at the end of the day. Interesting. So let's talk about if someone just has a goal then for highest expected returns, would that be a small cap value ETF? Or I guess I'm just wondering which product would give that highest expected return if you had to choose a couple for an investor? Yeah, I mean, just using size, value and profitability to identify stocks based on their expected return. Certainly, there's going to be a subset of the market. So it would be small cap companies with very low valuation ratios and relatively high profitability. That's going to be your highest expected return subset of the market. And if you had no other considerations whatsoever, certainly you could focus a portfolio just on a small uh, segment of the market like that. The challenge really comes down to, again, there, there's no free lunch out there, right? It's sort of like um, there's not a whole lot of foods out there that satisfy my competing goals of they're delicious and they're really good for me. So there are going to be trade-offs when it comes to risk and return. And in this case, your risk is, if you're defining it as the potential to underperform the market, it's not a sure bet even over a very long period of time that these expected return premiums that we talk about in the historical data are going to pan out because they're a fun you're Real performance is going to be a function of both the expected return and the unexpected return that you could not have predicted in advance. And that's going to be stuff that's affected by whatever's going on in the world at large. Um, there was a really cool academic paper from a few years ago from professors Eugene Fama and Ken French 
where they tried to estimate the probability of something like a group of stocks, um, say small value, for example, what is the probability they could underperform the market over a 10-year period? Now, we know historically they've outperformed the market pretty substantially, you know, by say 3 or 4% per year. But they estimated a probability of even over a 10-year period, these stocks underperforming, um, the probability is like 6%. So that's only like a couple of standard deviations. We're not exactly talking about a black swan event. And if that were to happen, then you would see the downside of being focused on only on having, I guess I should say, that much of a tilt away from the market. So for many investors, that won't be satisfactory to have that probability of outperforming over that longer period of time. And so they might, you know, they might decide to hew a little bit closer to the market. So that's why I guess to summarize, like, yes, there are very high expected return segments of the market. Um, and it kind of depends on how much investors are willing to tolerate in terms of their deviations. Okay. And so I guess if investors already hold a very broad based ETF, like a total market ETF, VTI or VOO for the S&P 500, and they want to start implementing a factor approach, is it wise for them to also keep those total stock market exposures or should they just move towards a more factor based approach? Yeah, I guess it kind of depends on their goals. I think that the beauty of our way of investing is that it works both kind of at the macro scale, so in a core type of strategy across regions, but it also works in component type strategy. So it sort of depends on where they want to make changes in terms of their asset allocation. You know, it's nice that both the research implies that this way of investing should work in really any segment of the market and also across our track record. I mean, we've seen that we've been able to generate outperformance versus markets and benchmarks, um, you know, not just at the market wide level, but also segment by segment and in both US and non US markets. And so I guess it's really not a bad way to go about incorporating that into your portfolio. I guess it's just more diversification at the end of the day, because you're buying the market. And so if they want to take a little bit less risk on that part, they keep it. But maybe if they want to go more risky, then more factors, is that kind of a good way to sum it up? Well, you're also thinking about just the overlap between different portfolios. And so, you know, if you think about, okay, is this expanding my opportunity set or, you know, how do I want to combine this in? You know, they might find that if you're combining a component portfolio with a, sort of a market wide solution, um, it could be increasing your expected returns. I don't think of that as necessarily increasing diversification because you're probably already holding many of these same stocks, but it's a way to increase your emphasis that you have on these stocks. Okay. And now I kind of want to talk about Dimensionals products because you have a lot of great active ETFs that investors can use to get exposure to these factors. And then there's also a bunch of passive ETFs that also give us exposure. So there's a lot of research done that shows that Dimensional has outperformed a lot of these passive instruments. But can you talk a little bit about what's driving this outperformance when both you and these other passive ETF providers, you're both targeting small cap, small cap value ETFs? What's kind of driving that? So this is where the importance of implementation comes in. And, you know, I can use a really simple example. So if we look at uh, the Russell indices, not index funds, this is before you even get to the costs associated with managing a strategy that's tracking these indices. But if I look at the Russell indices here in the U.S., you have the Russell 1000s, the largest 1000 stocks in the U.S. market. The Russell 2000 is the next smallest 2000 stocks. Very common measurements for uh, large caps and small caps in the U.S. If I go back to the inception for the data for these indices, 1979 in January, the Russell 1000 has had a higher average return since 1979 than the small cap Russell 2000. Um, it's been about a percentage point higher, actually. So that kind of tells you a really important lesson about implementation and capturing these premiums. We've seen there has been a size premium since 1979, but you can potentially miss out on some of it depending on the quality of your implementation. You know, in the case of the Russell 2000 versus Russell 1000, um, you have a couple of different elements here. You have some stocks that drag down the performance of small caps that are included in the Russell 2000 index. They're small caps with high prices and very low profitability. You have that reconstitution effect I talked about earlier, where when you have lots of buying and selling concentrated in a very short period of time, you can push prices. And if you push prices, you might end up buying at a very high price, selling at a very low price. So you can have on paper a similar type of asset allocation, but have very different results going forward. This is where I think um, in some cases the active versus passive 
categorization of strategies is not quite, it's a little too coarse grained. The way I would think about it is if you split the investments design into the philosophy behind why a portfolio is doing what it's doing versus the actual implementation, how it's doing what it's doing, I would apply the active versus passive delineation separately between those two. So the investment philosophy, well, passive, which if you go back to the early days, the first index funds that were launched, that's embracing market prices. It's a tacit admission that trying to outguess markets has generally not been successful. But the implementation, this is where you get to a big distinction between what dimensional does and then what a typical index fund is going to do. We believe in active implementation. And what that means is having a daily investment process that has flexibility. Rather than trading whatever the index tells us to, we're going to trade based on what we believe the portfolio should be holding on a day-to-day basis. And we have flexibility because we're not adhering to an index and we can buy stuff that has high expected returns a day. We can sell stuff that has lower expected returns and we can reevaluate that every single day. So just that element of flexibility is hugely impactful for setting us up for what we want to in our portfolios. And it allows us to capture, in our belief, more of the premium than if we lack that flexibility. Mm -hmm. And I went on Portfolio Visualizer today and I looked at the factor premiums, the loadings of dimensional versus some of the other passive ones like Vanguard's or iShares. And I could tell that the factor loadings are higher for dimensional funds. And so that was another thing that I kind of noticed about uh, the active strategy versus a passive one. It's you seem to get more of a premium or you got more of the small cap that you were looking for, the value tilt that you were looking for in those funds. So I found that interesting. Yeah, I mean, you can think of those factor loadings as telling you like the time series average, roughly speaking, of your exposure to one of these dimensions of expected return, like small cap value or profitability. And certainly the more of that you have, the higher the expected return. You know, what sometimes doesn't show up in a factor loading is kind of the the costs associated with attaining that loading. So like, you know, we were saying earlier, screens that you might want to have in a small cap space around lower profitability or downward momentum, uh, managing the trade-off between your tilts towards value and profitability. You know, those are things that um, don't necessarily show up in the asset allocation if you're looking at just size, value, and profitability, but are enormously critical to actually capturing those premiums net of the cost of implementation. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm so glad that we covered this all today because it's a lot for a new investor to take in. But at the end of the day, there's so many great products out there where they do it all for you. And so it's not like stock picking where you have to go out and be the best stock picker. It's you leave it up to a professional who has already done so much work in the space. So I'm super glad that we got to have this conversation today. I want to jump into some of the research that you've done too, because I really like a lot of the insights that you write on dimensional. One of them, I recently read an article you wrote, does fill in the blank belong in my portfolio? And I think that this article can resonate with a lot of investors because for those investors who are managing their portfolio themselves, we're often thinking does this belong in my portfolio? And so we have guests come on and talk about what investments they think are great or going to be in the next bull run. And it leaves us wondering at the end of the day, should I invest in this? Is this right for me? And so I really liked your analysis on this topic. And I was just hoping that you could go over how we can think about evaluating whether something actually belongs in our portfolio or not. Yeah, this is another challenging one for investors really to get started, which is you have all of these different options. I mean, we've been talking a lot about factor ETFs or or things that are, you know, in the mutual fund or ETF wrapper. Um, Even going beyond that, there's just so many other options investors have greeting them these days. And so there's no one size fits all type of approach. I think just having a very solid framework for how to evaluate the merit of an investment is a good place to start. And it can help you answer questions that are specific to your circumstances and what else you have in your portfolio. And it kind of comes down to a cost benefit analysis. It's pretty simple. It's like, okay, what's the benefit from adding in this uh, investment? In my view, it really should be one of two things that it needs to satisfy. It's either increasing your expected return or it's helping you manage risk. So we can unpack that one a little bit. So what's the evidence that this asset can increase your expected return, that it has higher returns than stuff that's elsewhere in your portfolio? 
certainly you want to see some really strong evidence that that's been the case historically. Is there good data on it? Is it something that has been a consistent value add to a portfolio? Can you make the case for it? It's really easy to make a case for an equity premium. So stocks having a higher return than bonds. Um, we think it's pretty sensible to make a case for size, value, and profitability premiums because they're telling you something, again, about how much you're paying or what you expect to receive. Um, if I don't have that kind of theoretical basis for why this should be delivering higher returns, then the empirical evidence better be really, really, really good. So that's one aspect. Managing risk. Um, you know, again, is it um, helping me tailor the volatility of my portfolio? Is it expanding my opportunity set? So is it providing diversification in addition to the, what's elsewhere in my portfolio? Um, you know, if it's providing a type of asset that is not present in the rest of my asset allocation, maybe it is expanding my opportunity set and helping to manage risk. And then you get down to the costs. And this is where it could be things as simple as like the opportunity costs. If I'm tying up capital in this investment over here, then that means I have less to deploy elsewhere in my portfolio where, you know, maybe I don't get to participate in other investments. Sometimes costs are as literal as what's the expense of investing here. So you get into something like private markets, those are going to have much higher costs than public markets. Um, so that's something for investors to be cognizant of. What this framework allows you to do is to think about individual examples and you start to ask questions about, okay, Given this framework, does this still make sense for me? A really simple example is cryptocurrencies, or if we just look at Bitcoin. So would an investor want to have that in their portfolio? So let's go through these criteria, you know, relatively quickly, but one at a time. So what's the expected return case for cryptocurrency? And frankly, there's not a real solid one. Holding one Bitcoin today doesn't entitle me to more Bitcoin in the future, right? So it doesn't have the same logic behind why I expect to gain return from holding stocks or gain return from holding bonds. The volatility of cryptocurrency, I think, is dissuasive of it being a risk management tool. So then it's not totally clear what role it would play in a portfolio. And then you also look at, okay, is this expanding my opportunity set? Well, the total value of Bitcoin, this is going to be probably completely outdated because those valuations tend to fluctuate on a week-to-week -week basis. But the last time I checked, it was less than 0.5% of the value of the global stock in bond markets. So that would imply that if you had a million dollar portfolio, you would have less than $50,000 in Bitcoin and market cap weights. And so, you know, when you start to assess something based on these criteria, then in some cases that can be a more helpful way to think about what goes in your portfolio than just, oh, well, this sounds interesting. You know, it's a more robust type of assessment. That was super, super helpful. And I think that that's applicable for yeah any investment we come across. We hear about these hot stocks or hot ETF funds that maybe seem really appealing to buy or inflation hedges, but it comes down to those things you talked about. And I think that's just such a great framework that we can use for all of our choices going forward. And I also want to talk to you about um, inflation hedges because it kind of ties into what we just talked about. And if we should add them, we can kind of work through that framework. But Dimensional actually did a really great paper on this. This is something that I've been thinking about for a long time. And a lot of our listeners, it's on their minds about how can we hedge against inflation? And so I really love Dimensional's paper on this titled U.S. Inflation and Global Asset Returns. And I was just hoping that you could talk a bit about this and if there are any assets that are hedges against expected inflation and unexpected inflation and kind of the key takeaways for our listeners. Yeah, and you said it uh, well, just mentioning the distinction between expected and unexpected inflation. So these names are very transparent in terms of what they imply. So expected inflation is what the market believes is going to be the rise in consumer prices in the future. And unexpected inflation is obviously the other side of the coin. It's really what could happen to consumer prices that is not currently expected by the market. Now, if we believe markets are forward-looking and they include information about expectations of current market prices, which that's you know, the main ethos of dimensional, that implies the expected inflation should be compensated in the form of current asset prices, meaning the expected returns are going to compensate you for expected changes in consumer prices. Now, the outcome of that nicely aligns with what we see in the data, which is that most asset classes have outperformed, have delivered positive real returns, so positive average returns net of inflation, even in high inflation years. We see that across 
all segments of fixed income apart from one month U.S. Treasury bills. That was the only asset that didn't outpace inflation. But you know, corporate bonds, government bonds, longer dated bonds, uh, all of these different segments of equity markets, whether it's factor portfolios like small value or you know different sectors, all of them have delivered positive average real returns, which is consistent with the idea that if what you're trying to do is outpace expected inflation, traditional asset classes can do it. It kind of goes back to the previous framework about does XYZ belong in your portfolio. If you feel like you're probably about of average sensitivity to the effects of inflation, and if you believe markets are reflecting expected inflation and prices, you might not have to do anything with your asset allocation, which is nice. Now, there are going to be people who either have a different belief of inflation going forward than the market as a whole, or maybe they are more sensitive to the impact of increases in consumer prices than the average investor. Mm -hmm. Those investors might want to hedge unexpected inflation. Now, there's a bit of a caveat here. You know, if you think about a risk management tool, generally you're not going to be able to manage risk without giving up something. In this case, it's going to be expected returns. So, to hedge risk, you know, I would say that it needs to really do two things well. Number one, it needs to be positively correlated with inflation. So, as consumer prices go up, the value of this asset should go up. There's actually a number of uh, asset classes that will satisfy that one. The second part of hedging unexpected inflation means that it has it should have relatively low volatility. And the reason why is if I'm concerned about inflation, at the end of the day, what I'm really concerned about is whether what I've saved up today is going to continue to afford in the future um, what I can afford today. Am I going to preserve my purchasing power? And there needs to be a narrowing of volatility around that, right? So if I have something that is correlated with inflation, but it has huge return volatility, then that's still introducing a lot of uncertainty into what I can spend in the future. So we do have assets out there that can satisfy those two criteria, um, inflation-protected bond portfolios, whether it's TIPS that are offered by the U.S. Treasury or bond portfolios that have inflation protection overlays where they purchase inflation swaps and manage unexpected inflation that way. Um, those have been successful in curbing the impact of unexpected inflation. Other asset classes that are positively correlated with inflation, but really, in my view, haven't been as good of inflation hedges, uh, whether it's energy stocks, whether it's commodities, they only check one of those two boxes. They do check the box of being positively correlated, but they have much more volatility than inflation itself. So again, it kind of comes back to what your goals are. To manage a risk, you're generally going to have to give up something in return. And that's kind of, that's up to each investor to decide where they want to be in that spectrum. That was super, super helpful. Thank you for going over that with us. I think it's really interesting to hear you bring that evidence back to it because we've heard a lot about energy being a great diversifier. And that is true. And while that was shown to be true in the paper as well, it adds so much volatility, as you mentioned. And so if you're someone who doesn't want to experience a bunch of volatility, then that investment probably wouldn't be right for you. And so they can go back and think about that framework that you talked about as well to figure out if it really fits in their portfolio and if they think it's worth it with that additional, I guess, volatility it would add. Yeah. I mean, you know, the energy stocks, again, are going to outpace inflation, just like we believe all other stocks should. And so then the question is, would you want to overweight energy stocks? Well, if your goal is to manage your inflation exposure, and if you want to hedge unexpected inflation, you know, we find that that's a less sensible way to do it than just having inflation protected bond portfolios. Mm -hmm. And just on that unexpected inflation thing, the last time I looked, markets were still expecting inflation or pricing in inflation to be around 3%, which was interesting to me because it's still nowhere near that. And so to me, that would suggest that hedging against unexpected inflation could be important for some people if that actually, if inflation persists higher than expected by the markets, but we'll never know that until after the fact. Yeah. And that's one of the challenges with looking at, um, you know, we have these proxies for the market's expectation of inflation that you might've been alluding to, which is we'll look at the difference between yields on inflation protected versus nominal bonds. They're not an exact proxy for expected inflation. There's some other you know things kind of going on with that measure, whether it's, it's actually a, a premium you get for bearing the risk of inflation that's in nominal bonds, which accounts for some of that difference in yields. It's also technically just the, it, it would be, we call it break even for a reason where if inflation ends up being exactly what that break even number is. So, you know, if it is 3%, if actual inflation is being 3% over that horizon, then you were indifferent effectively, whether you had nominals or inflation-protected bonds. Uh, 
So that's kind of one consideration. Certainly, we've seen some cooling of the CPI prints. I think we probably all noticed the market going wild last week when CPI was just slightly lower than expected. But, you know, even if you have an expectation of inflation in the future, and even if it's a market gauge, the deviation between realized inflation and expected inflation can be enormous. If we go back to April, where the trailing 12-month change in consumer prices was you know, over 8%, if we go back to the beginning of that 12-month period, expected inflation was about 2.5%. So um, clearly there was a big divergence there. And I think that's, you know, at the end of the day, if, if you were especially sensitive to that, then it might make sense to try and hedge out that unexpected inflation. Um, but again, I think if your primary gauge of what is going to impact your um, ability to spend is just reflecting what expected inflation is, you might be covered with traditional asset allocations. Mm -hmm. And I guess given that this will be such a small period in time, hopefully for many of our investors' long-term portfolios, which probably have horizons of 15, 20 years, this period isn't like massive in the grand scheme of things, I suppose. And so I also want to talk to you. You have another great article. It's called Fangs Gone Value. And so this is really interesting. Fang stocks have been such a big topic recently. You talk about how some of the Fang stocks have been reclassified as value companies. So I'm just wondering if you can walk us through what does this mean and what doesn't it mean for future expected returns? I think it can be sometimes confused by some investors when they think about this. Yeah, I thought this was just an interesting anecdote because for so long, you know, there was a there was some opposition around the value premium or value investing that was really rooted in this belief that we were in a new normal, that technology firms were the way to go and that you know these growth stocks were really poised for long-term success. And I always thought of that as conflating the characteristics of a good company with the characteristics of a good investment set. And what I mean by that is Investors are desiring higher expected returns generally. A company that is really strong, that um, has been very successful historically, one of the largest firms in the U.S., all else being equal, should have a lower discount rate expected to the expected, expected future cash flows. If everyone believes this firm is going to be great for a long time, there's maybe less uncertainty around what their cash flows are going to be in the future. So I think that's an interesting backstop because, again, you know, these five companies, these FANG stocks being the poster children for why value investing was dead. It's mildly ironic that two of them became value this year. You know, we wrote that before the the losses got even bigger. I think at this point they've lost um, over two and a half trillion in terms of market capitalization between those five stocks. If that were to be its own stock market, that would be the fifth largest stock market in the entire world, which is kind of interesting. But I, I think it just comes back to the principles of you know, what tells you about differences in expected returns? If you knew which companies were going to be the rock stars in the future and you can get in on them early, then yes, that would be a very high rate of return strategy. Um, but unless you can predict those in advance, the companies that are already at the top of the market might not be the highest expected return stocks for investors. Another takeaway that I would just love to share with our listeners is in that article, you talked about what happens, what typically happens to stocks of companies that grow to become the largest in the market and kind of what happens to their expected returns. Can you share that with our audience? Yeah, you know, you can think about this in terms of a career progression for an employee where, you know, as you um, rise up the ranks of a firm, the expectations keep increasing. So you're going to be gaining potentially higher and higher compensation, but then the stuff that you did when you were an analyst might not be, it might not really cut it if you're an executive at that point, right? And so as the expectations start to rise, that's the way I think about companies is they rise up the ranks of the largest firms in the U.S. You know, the stuff that propelled them to the top of the market was probably rewarded with really strong realized returns. Uh, but then going forward, once the expectation is excellence, their expected returns might actually go down because what happens is valuations go up, right? The threshold for what is uh, acceptable for the productivity of that firm goes up. And that's what you see in the data. So if we track companies, um, if you look back historically, every time a company joins the top 10 for the U.S. market, and when I say top 10, that's just largest 10 based on market capitalization. In the years leading up to them joining the top 10, they have really strong returns versus the market, outperforming the broad market by over 10% per year. But then once they join the top 10, their returns look very similar to the market. And in fact, 
five years after they've joined uh, the top 10, they actually tend to slightly underperform the broad market. And so I just think that comes back to expectations and how those get embedded into valuations. All that's being equal, the higher the valuation for a company, the lower the expected return because they're pricing in great success and they're willing to pay a very high price for those future cash flows. Yeah, I found that super interesting when reading that because I think a lot of investors might think the opposite where a larger company would now all of a sudden it's made it to the top. So they're going to stay there or they're going to continue to meet those expectations. But it's just really cool looking at what the data has to say and it makes it very clear. And it's not that it's guaranteed, but it is just very interesting to take that into consideration with your investments. And another one that I want to talk to you about because I found this really interesting when reading it is how you talk about value is an asset class and not an investment strategy and so talking about this on our show a lot of our listeners are familiar with Warren Buffett style value investing approach and that's a strategy so I was wondering if you could kind of talk about this distinction and explain what you mean by value is an asset class and not a strategy Yeah, I think of it as the sentiment behind value investment. When people talk about that as a way to go about buying stocks, what they're really talking about is just generally speaking, looking for low price stocks. There are dozens of different ways you can potentially measure the price of a stock to determine whether it's high or low. So I think the main takeaway for me is when I look at value investing, it comes in lots of different forms and not all of them have been similarly successful. And, you know, we talked about some of the ways in which a, uh, you know, a strategy that is adhering rigidly to an index might leave some of the premium on the table. You can have so-called style drift where you might start out with really good value exposure at the moment of rebalancing, but then during the course of the year in between rebalance events, you, know, you can start to drift and have a good portion of your portfolio no longer in value. But that can happen for active reasons as well. So there was a paper uh, a few years back where they look at the holdings of value mutual funds, uh, you know, it was across all U.S. domicile mutual funds. And what they saw was a large portion of value mutual funds actually plotted out like growth stocks. They were high price to book stocks. So we see that anecdotally when we look at, for example, the U.S. large cap value category in Morningstar and just pull out all the value strategies there. It's probably over 200 of them over the past 10 years. And their valuation ratio, so if I look at the aggregate price to book, it plots out everywhere from right around one all the way up to over seven. So there's a lot of dispersion in terms of the characteristics, and that can come from anything that causes you to drift from a focus on value stocks. The reason why that's relevant is because the less exposure, actually, let me flip this into a glass half full. The more exposure you have to the value premium, the more consistent you are in that exposure, the better your performance is going to be when the value premium is positive. Again, all else being equal. So that, that's why you would want that consistent focus. And when we think about the design of our portfolios, we're trying to, number one, be broadly diversified. We don't know what stocks are going to deliver the value premium in any given year. It's not all of them. In fact, that was another really uh, seminal paper from Fama and French where they showed that it was a small subset of the asset class that delivered the premium. We want to make sure we're holding those, hence the broad diversification but also the consistent focus. As prices change, we want to be making incremental changes to our portfolio on a daily basis so we capture those stocks when they deliver the value premium. And I think when you look at just all of the different ways that you could potentially miss out on the premium, that's where I I come back to that notion of uh, value is, it can sound great in theory, but the actual results on paper can vary drastically. That was so great. Thank you so much, Wes. Before I let you go today, where can our listeners go to learn more about Dimensional, their products, and everything that you do there? So you can always go to our site, which in the U.S. is us.dimensional.com, I believe. I have a bookmark, and I don't remember the exact web address. Certainly, if you Google Dimensional Fund Advisors, it will pop up, and there you can find everything from our investment philosophy, you know, a lot of the commentary we have on market events, it's public facing, and then of course a whole you know suite of information on all the different investment strategies that we offer. Mm-hmm. I'll make sure to link the website in the show notes and the listeners will have that there for them. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much. I'd say probably the biggest problem in Latin America is the structural distribution of income. So much income goes to the top of society. There's not very good systems in place.
probably the biggest area where people get into trouble with dividend investing is trying to buy something with a very high yield today and not asking enough questions about where that yield comes from.